All right, so today we're talking about uh, partitioning techniques. We started this a little bit last time in dealing with pH and reviewing the ice tables and uh, acid-base equilibrium chemistry. But today we put it into, into use in terms of partitioning. And when we say partitioning, we're, we're, what do you do when you have a partition? Like in this room, if we had partitions, we could divide the room in half, right? And we could have two small groups but with this partition. And that's essentially what we're doing chemically. We're trying to separate our analyte from the matrix and from other things that might interfere with the signals that we would get from that analyte. So there's different ways of partitioning. Uh, one very good way is extraction. So if you have uh, the matrix and you have some way of extracting the analyte from that matrix, then that's a very good thing. You can do that with, say, gas phase. If your matrix is, if your analyte is more volatile than the matrix, you can just warm it up and take the headspace, the gas off, and you've partitioned it by gas phase and liquid phase. Um, digestion, let's say your analyte is really stuck inside the matrix and you need to break it, that matrix apart. That's what we call digestion. And so just like your body digests its food to get the nutrients out, we do this in the analytical lab. And think about um, like the metal content uh, of, of a substance. That, that metal may be, may be a solid. It may be in the soil or silicate matrix. Um, and you've got to do a lot of work chemically to get that analyte out. We just got a call from geology, and they were asking if we had any kind of, of hoods that could handle hydrogen fluoride, HF. Because some of the, one of the research students wants to do digestion of silicates. So the components of soil to get the trace metals out of that. And one of them is to interact that and digest that silicate matrix with uh, HF. And it's a really dangerous compound. So we don't have anybody in the chemistry department that's willing to work with HF. So we don't have a hood, we don't have the facilities. It's gotta be a Teflon lined hood. And you've got to have all of these personal protective uh, um, you know, PPE on so that if HF gets on your skin, it will just continue to eat through the skin all the way to the bone. And there's really no way to stop it. So you have to prevent an exposure. Once you get an exposure, you've got a really big problem on your hands. So we just prefer not to do that. <laughs> so I told him, I said, you need to find a different way. <laughs> but that would be digestion. He's using that to chew up the matrix and to release the analyte. Uh, <clears throat> so some of the digestion techniques that that are used in chemistry and also in over at tries is acid digestion. And so you'll take the matrix and you'll put it in strong acid. We have hydrochloric acid, you have sulfuric acid and nitric acid. But sometimes those are not strong enough, believe it or not. Concentrated nitric acid, not strong enough. And so then they make aqua regia, okay, which is nitric acid and, and hydrochloric acid mixed together. And it makes this bright red acid solution. It's, Pretty scary looking. It's a very strong acid. It will destroy lots of materials and release those analytes. And if that's not strong enough, there's a thing called piranha solution. And a piranha solution is sulfuric acid mixed with hydrogen peroxide. And so this, these are the extreme levels of digestive media so that you can break apart whatever matrix you have and release those analytes. So that would be digestion, where the, the solution attacks the matrix and the analytes are released in aqueous form. And then you would bring them over and adjust the pH and get it suitable for whatever instrumentation that you're going to use. Headspace analysis. You know, this is uh, we talked about breathalyzers. So that's one way to analyze the alcohol in the blood. It's just to use the headspace. So the the lungs are in intimate contact with the blood. That's how we exchange oxygen and CO2. And if we drink a lot of ethanol. That's in the blood. It's going to be exchanged with the air in your lungs. And so your air in your lungs will have a certain partial pressure of ethanol depending on your blood alcohol content. And so when you blow into a breathalyzer, you're blowing that headspace into the breathalyzer. And then it's backtracking to see, because it's assuming an equilibrium in your lungs with your, with your bloodstream, what your blood alcohol content is. So that's headspace analysis. It works really well if you have a... a a Henry's law constant that's greater than the vapor pressure. So we'll talk just a little bit about that. So this is Routes law. The, the pressure of the analyte is, is proportional to uh, the vapor pressure of that analyte and times its mole fraction. 
And so let's say you have a, a mole fraction, which is the moles of analyte divided by the total moles of the solution. And so if you have a 10% by mole concentration, then your pressure of your analyte would be 10% of its pure vapor pressure. And so that way you could get to the blood alcohol content, at least on a mole percent basis, by using Ralph's law. But sometimes things don't behave ideally. They, they, uh, they have a different proportionality constant. You still have the, the um, mole fraction, but it may behave as if it has a much higher vapor pressure. And so Henry's law is right here, and they just replaced the vapor pressure of the pure substance with some Henry's law constant. And it's valid for very dilute solutions. If you can do an analysis, let's say we're using blood as an example, if you do an analysis and you find that, that ethanol comes out of the blood much easier than it would, say, um, in a Ralph's Law case, let's say it's an un, a non-ideal mixture, and that may be the case because you've got red blood cells, you've got all kinds of other things in the blood. It's not just water. Okay. Then if you know the Henry's Law constant, for blood, for alcohol in blood, then you can use a breathalyzer. And so I don't know which they use for those breathalyzers, but it's likely because blood is such an unusual solution. It's not just pure water that it probably has a Henry's Law constant instead of just the pure vapor pressure of ethanol. And so this, uh, for sensitivity, it says partitioning requires that the Henry's Law constant be much greater than the analyte uh, vapor pressure. Uh, for partitioning, but also for sensitivity. So just, you know, let's say this is 10 times higher than that, then a 1% um, analyte concentration, so 1% blood alcohol concentration would give the same signal as a 10% uh, blood alcohol concentration with Ralph's Law. And so that would be if the Henry's Law constant was 10 times more than the vapor pressure. You'd get 10 times more signal. And so you could detect much less blood in the, uh, alcohol in the blood. In the lab, we can use this too. If we have an analyte dissolved in a, in a matrix, you can drive it to the headspace if it's more volatile than the matrix by just adding heat. So we typically don't use Bunsen burners, but they've got a little drawing here. And then you can, you can inject that gas directly onto the GC. But gas, direct injection of gases, uh, it is a thing. You can do that. Uh, the sample volume is quite large. You're putting like a whole mill of gas onto the GC, and to inject a whole milliliter of gas very quickly is difficult. And to do it exactly the same way every time is also difficult. And so we use the internal standards method. We're going to do headspace analysis so that injector to injector variation can be canceled out by dividing by that internal standard signal. So if you're going to do uh, Headspace analysis, you're probably going to need an internal standard. There's a new technique, fairly new, it's probably the last 15 or 20 years, called solid phase micro extraction, where you have this, instead of a, a gas syringe, you're actually not sucking anything up into a syringe. You just have a polymer fiber that you put down in there, and then the molecules stick to this polymer fiber. And so you, uh, you ever see those, those uh, static stickers that you stick on glass? You know, you peel them off and it's a really clean surface. And so you sit it on glass and it just, it's, there's no glue there. The polymer just sticks to the surface because it's a really clean surface. Once that polymer gets dirty, it doesn't stick anymore. Have you noticed that? So you peel that off, you've got a really clean surface and it's very sticky. Same thing with solid phase micro extraction, only it's a needle. It's like a, a metal rod coated in polymer. And how do you clean that? Well, you stick it in a really hot environment. So you can put it into a GC inlet and it would drive all the molecules off. Essentially, now you've got a very clean polymer. And then you can pull it back up in there. It pulls it into a metal sleeve where it stays clean. And then you go analyze. And you can expose that fiber for 30 seconds, a minute, you know, however long. The longer you expose it, the more molecules stick to that polymer. Pull it up into the metal sleeve, take it back over to the GC and inject it. And then all those molecules jump off. So it's a solid phase, that's the polymer, the sticky polymer. Micro extraction, because it's extracting at the micro level. 
You can do that in liquid. You can put it in the liquid and expose it, and those ethanol molecules would stick to the polymer. Or you can do it in the headspace, and those would stick uh, in the polymer in the headspace as well. They've been doing solid phase microextraction at the body farm. They'll hold these fibers over bodies and sample the gases above the bodies. And then a couple of those projects I've seen come through as people have given talks. Before moving on, anything that uh, you want to ask about? Okay. Now let's talk about liquid liquid extraction. So before we had uh, like gas solid or, or gas liquid partitioning. Now we're going to partition between two liquids. And this is the main focus of today's lecture. We're going to deal with organic phases and aqueous phases. So trying to decide how to get a molecule to go into the organic phase or to pull it into the aqueous phase. So last time you heard, it, heard me emphasize, great, I don't have any malware. Um, last time you heard me emphasize that ionized substances are soluble. Now I was talking about soluble in water. So they're going to be um, hydrophilic if they're ionized. And so in a liquid-liquid extraction scheme, if you have an ionized substance, it's going to go into the aqueous phase. All of these drugs are organic molecules. So if they, you make them neutral, they're going to go into the organic phase. And so that's the overarching principle. Using pH and equilibrium to drive things into the organic phase as neutrals or into the aqueous phase as ionized, either negative ionized or positive. And so we use this uh, water octanol two-phase liquid system to decide whether something is lipophilic or, li or hydrophilic or lipophilic. And so for drugs, this fat solubility is just as important as water solubility. So you take a drug that's fat soluble in your, in your um, orally, and you're probably not going to get very much of it. Because what does it have to do to get into your body if you ingest it? It's got to be aqueous in some manner, right? It's, it, and if it's totally hydrophobic, it's going to stay with the other components that are not digestible. So you know, there's a lot that you eat that's just not digestible, like pretty much all of celery. <laughs> right? So you eat celery, and you don't get any calories from it, not because there's no caloric content to the cellulose, but it's mostly cellulose. It doesn't break down very much in the stomach and it doesn't go into your bloodstream. You get a few of the components out, but mostly that's just fiber, and it just goes right through you, okay? If you have a, a hydrophobic drug, and you eat it, and you, it's with, in your stomach with other stuff like celery fiber, it's just gonna stay with the fiber and go through the body and never really get into your bloodstream and do what that drug is meant to do. And this explains why some drugs and vaccines and things are still injected because you've got to get them into the bloodstream in some way and you can inject a fat soluble drug into the fatty layer right under your skin and it will slowly go into the body because it's been introduced through the skin um, or into the muscle an intramuscular uh, injection and that's a way you would deliver something that's fat soluble <clears throat> and it will move slowly through the body and stay in the body a lot longer and so sometimes we can't do oral formulations just because they're so uh, hydrophobic. So if you put a substance in this separatory funnel and shake it so it's well mixed, let it you know, settle down, let the layers uh, reestablish themselves, then you can take some of the aqueous layer off and inject that in a GC or an LC and see what the concentration of that substance is. And then you could take some out of the octanol layer and inject that and analyze it and see what the uh, concentration is. And this will give you that water octanol partition coefficient, which is up here. So you have the concentration in octanol divided by the concentration in water, and that gives us that P value. That is a measure of how lipophilic it is. So if it's a big P value, it's fat soluble. If it's a low P value, it's water soluble. This will tell you something about the molecule in terms of uh, how to separate it. If you have something that has a very high partition coefficient, a lipophilicity, 
then it's going to want to go into that organic phase. And it'll be very easy to separate it. Say you have it in an aqueous situation and you want to extract it from that matrix, you put it in contact with an organic solvent and shake it, and it's going to fly into the oct octanol phase. Or chloroform or ethyl acetate, whatever organic phase you're using. <clears throat> so let's talk about liquid liquid extraction. And we're going to pose a, a liquid liquid extraction scheme that separates a sample that contains naproxen sodium, so a leave, you know, the active ingredient in a leave, and codeine HCl. So step one in any of these schemes is to get more information. We need to know what naproxen sodium is, and we need to know what codeine is. And more importantly, we need to know if they're acids or bases and what their pKa values are. So that's the information you need. So we go to the I mean, what kind of reference books, is, books are you familiar with? You've had Instrumental, you've had PCHEM. What, is, what are the reference books that you've gone to in the past? Jen Kim book, okay. So the table's in the back of the Jen Kim book. You're probably not going to find these. You might find codeine, but probably not in a proxy. Biochem book. Biochem book, so again, table's in the back of the Biochem book. And Just flipping through the text, trying to find information. Okay, those are good. Those are instructional texts, though, so they have a limited amount of data, right? So you may not find what you need in those, but those are really good starting points. The NIST, the NIST website, so that's really good, okay? And the NIST website is very similar to another sort of classic reference book, and that's the CRC handbook. You guys have used the CRC handbook? Here's the CRC handbook. You know, you've so if you've gone to it online, then, then that's, that's fine. You don't get the satisfaction of feeling how heavy this thing is. Um, but you know, this thing's over 1,000 pages. And it doesn't even tell you. The, it just has section and then page. So there's really no way to look at it and see how many pages it, are, it is. But um, probably 1,500 pages. And weighs about uh, two pounds. And, and so this is the CRC handbook. Why, what's, what's CRC? Do you know what that stands for? So you come in here and look, and does it even say? It stands for the Chemical Rubber Company. I can't see that it says that in here. It just says CRC Press. But that's what, the, so this was a company handbook that they made for their engineers back in the 20s. <laughs> and so then they got bigger and bigger and bigger as it became a bigger desk reference. But it was made by a company for their engineers and scientists because it had the data that they needed to do their job. And it doesn't have a lot about pharmaceuticals like naproxen, sodium, or codeine. In fact, I don't know if they're even in here. And if they are in here, it might not have their pKa values. It might not have their um, their uh, water octanol coefficients or you know what they're soluble in in terms of organic solvents so even though the CRC is maybe 1500 pages it doesn't have the information we need because it's published originally by the chemical rubber company and it, it was focused on material science and organic synthesis and those kinds of things it wasn't focused on pharmaceuticals so where might you look for for a reference that would have all kinds of information about pharmaceutical components something made by a drug company, right? And so then you have the Merck Index. So this is kind of like the CRC made by the Chemical Rubber Company, but it's the Merck Index made by Merck Pharmaceuticals, and it is focused on all of the different kinds of drugs. And let's flip this camera over so that people can see it. So this is the Merck Index, and it's, it's got all of these different drugs in here. It's got information about their pKa values, whether they're basic or acidic, because you can see the structure. And it's got uh, even some toxicological information in there, uh, lethal doses, and so on. So it'll tell you how, how, uh, what the health risks are related to the different substances. Yes? Um, so there are other pharmaceutical companies looking different drugs. Does the Merck Index actually look at those drugs as well? Yes, it does. So the question was, does it contain things made by other companies? And yes, it's become a general desk reference. So. Um, it covers everything that, that, that they can put in there that comes out. It, you know, it might even have all of the different analogs for fentanyl. I haven't looked at those, but those are more active uh, in research right now because 
the different fentanyl logs are being found in crime scenes and so on. And so uh, I'm sure fentanyl's in here because it's been an anesthetic for a long time. Um, but like car fentanyl and some of the other uh, analogs, I'm not sure. But this would be the place you would look. You would probably not find them in the CRC. So step one, always get more information. Now, in, in reality, for this class, you're going to be given the information you need. Uh, but that would be where this information comes from. So if we go to the... <clears throat> Go to the Merck index, we find that this is naproxen sodium, and it's an acid. Do you see the acid group over there, the carboxylic acid group? And this is codeine, and it's a base. You see the nitrogen, it's protonated in this case. And so this is, from the Merck index, you would find things that you could put in this table. You have the, the pKa values, so that's 4.2. So at pH higher than 4.2, this proton would be taken off. Okay. And at pH lower than 4.2, it would be protonated. And then here is the, P, uh, the pKa for codeine, HCl. So at, at pH higher than 8.2, that proton would come off. And at pH lower than 8.2, it would be protonated. So this tells you where the, the things deprotonated or protonated. And then you look at it and say, okay, an acid would be ionized at pH higher than 4.2, so it would be water-soluble. And it would be protonated below pH 4.2, so it would be, it'd be organic-soluble, it wouldn't be water-soluble. Now, which organic phase, I mean, this one, show, here's a log P. So um, if we go back a few slides, we see that, that partition coefficient and how much it loves octanol versus water. Okay. And so this is uh, greater than 1, so that means it likes octanol quite a bit. So it's fat-soluble. This one's 0.6. So that means it, it kind of likes water. Okay. And, and we, kinda, we will see that, uh, that here. You see, this one is more soluble in water. It's, it can go one part coating to 20 parts water. So it can be up to 5% concentrated in water. Anything above that, it'll start to precipitate out. But that's quite a lot. And, and the naproxen sodium is insoluble in water as the acid form. Okay. And then ethanol, this 1 to 25, so that's 1 part to 25 parts water. So that would be, say, 1 gram of naproxen sodium to 25 grams of water. Or 1 to 15, so 1 gram of, to, of naproxen sodium to 15 grams, not water, I said water, but I meant ethanol. In here, 15 grams of chloroform. So it's pretty soluble in chloroform. And down here, this is not very soluble in chloroform. So one part to 800. So I could put maybe one gram of, of codeine into 800 grams of chloroform. And so you see that you've got a lot more solvent before it starts to precipitate out. And so, and so this is the largest difference. And so this kind of tells us we want to use chloroform for our organic layer where there's a biggest difference in solubility. We're going to use water for one layer, and we're going to use chloroform for the other layer. And then we're going to adjust the pH so that one of these molecules goes to the organic layer and one goes to the aqueous layer. And then we just use the SEP funnel and we separate them at the meniscus, the interface between the two layers, and we've totally separated these drugs. And that's pretty nice. We haven't had to go, you know, we haven't had to do anything more complex than Put the, the formulation in, add water, add chloroform, shake, vent, shake, vent, shake, vent, you're ready to go, and then you use the little spigot and you can separate the two layers and you've separated the drugs. So that's liquid-liquid extraction. And so you have the li one liquid is the organic phase, one liquid is the aqueous phase. So now we have to decide what pH to make the aqueous layer because that's what's really going to drive things into the organic phase or pull them out. And so at pH less than 4.2, we have both of these species. At less than 4.2, which was the pKa for naproxen, we have uh, that protonated naproxen, and it's neutral, okay, up here. This is a neutral molecule. It's going to want to go into the organic phase. This is ionized. And again, below 4.2, actually for the codeine, anything below 8.3 would be protonated, but definitely below 4.2. And then the other, 
the other pH or other pKa was for the codeine, and above 8.2, it's been deprotonated. It's in a basic enough solution that it stole the proton from the codeine. And so now it's a neutral species and would tend to be soluble in the organic layer. And the proxen sodium has been deprotonated and it's ionized and would be soluble in the aqueous layer. So we can choose either one. We can pick a, a basic pH and we'd have molecules go in two different layers. And we could use an acidic pH and have the molecules swap layers. But depending on the pH, one is going to be the organic, the other is going to be aqueous. You swap the pH, they're going to swap places. Okay. So which pH would you pick? We would certainly avoid the ones in between. Because avoiding the ones in between, uh, if we were in between, we would have a deprotonated naproxen, and we'd still have a protonated codeine, and they would both go into the aqueous phase. And that's not partition, right? Yeah, and so the 4.2, that's a good point. 4.2 is right at the pKa, and so we'd want to be at least one unit further uh, to the left. And so we'd want to be at least to 3.2. You know, 3 would be great. And so we'd have 100% uh, uh, protonation of the naproxen. Right at 4.2, we'd have 50-50 of the naproxen uh, protonated and deprotonated. So let's do this on the board, and I'll show you one way to set this up. So let's go with five. Okay. I'm going to call the proxen in. Okay. And I'm going to call the codeine C. And I'm just showing you how I do these problems. Okay. And so I've drawn them on this little, this little table. But this x-axis, I'm going to call pH. And we have 14 at this end. And we could say 0 at that end. Very hard to get less than 1, but still. pH, 0 to 14. And then I'm going to mark on here the, the pKa's for, for both of the substances. So down here around 4.2, we have the naproxen sodium. So 4.2. And then the codeine was 8.3. Did I get those right? Look at your notes. Make sure. Was 8.3 and 4.2? 8.2. 8.2. Okay. Make sure that it matches. Okay. So now that I've got this table, I've got four panels on here. And I want to put labels in these panels. I want to do what we call speciation. So what species are we talking about in these four panels? So over here, the, the naproxen sodium is an acid. So I'm going, to, I'm going to represent that by HN to show that it has a removable proton, but it's neutral. <laughs> OK? And then when I go above 4.2, that H has been pulled off, and I have N plus. I mean, N minus. We lost an H plus, so I have an N minus. So do you see how that tells me what species is present based upon pH? So below 4.2, I have HN, and it's neutral. And above 4.2, I have N minus, and it's charged. It will go in the aqueous phase. Okay? So this one would be HN, it would be organic. And this would be N minus, and it would be aqueous. <clears throat> Can you see that okay, Morgan? Yeah. Okay. Let's do the same thing for the codeine. Codeine's a base, okay? So <clears throat> over here on the left, where I've got a lot, because it's low pH, I've got a lot of excess protons, it's going to be protonated on the left. And so I'm going to have C, and I'm just going to put H plus. So it's received that proton, it's charged, it's aqueous. If I put it in a basic environment and I get it a pH above 8.2, the base is going to steal that proton away from codeine. And so I'm going to, it's going to have C. 
and that's going to be organic. So this is, I call it, you call it, I don't really what it's called, I kind of made it up to do these problems, the speciation chart, you know, based on pH, and it allows you to do this, this partitioning where you have the organic phase and aqueous phase, so you see anything left of 4.2, which would be in which layer? The, the naproxen and sodium in its protonated form would be neutral and it would be an organic layer and the codeine would be protonated to be in the aqueous layer. If you get above 8.2, they've swapped places. There were N minus, the deprotonated naproxen would be in the aqueous layer, and the deprotonated neutral codeine would be in the organic layer. Now when we looked at the, uh, we looked at the Merck index, or the information from the Merck, and we saw that uh, the naproxen sodium was much more soluble in codeine as a neutral species, so it's really going to want to go into the organic layer, then we probably want to use the 3.2 or 3 pH because it's very soluble in chloroform. And this will be in the aqueous layer. So chloroform will pull all of that naproxen in, and you would have a very good separation scheme. So that's how you would decide between having it above, like 9, or below 4. Is Then you would look to see which one's happier in the organic phase. And this one was very happy in the organic phase. And so we would go with 3 pH. And so that would give us very good partitioning and uh, a good liquid-liquid extraction scheme. In the homework is one where you have three components. So how would you do three? You just put another row up here and look at the speciation of that one. And you may have to do it in two steps. You may have to use one step to pull one into the aqueous and leave two in the organic. You drain that aqueous off. You put in more aqueous at a different pH, and then they split again. And you, So you do two steps to get, get three compounds apart from each other. And it's pretty efficient, so you can do this many, many times and just keep driving things into the organic or the aqueous phase, depending upon the pH of the aqueous phase. So in this case, if we chose our, our pH dilute phosphoric acid, we could have a pH of 2, put that in the separatory funnel, and up here would be water with, with dilute phosphoric acid. And so the codeine is going to come up into the aqueous layer, the naproxen is going to be in the chloroform, and the, the separation, the naproxen in terms of its solubility in, in water, uh, going to be 1 to 15 in the chloroform, and it said insoluble in water, so essentially your, your partition is going to be infinite. <laughs> All the naproxen is going to go to the, to the organic layer. The, um, the partition of the codeine, HCl, is 1 to 800 in the, in the chloroform and 1 to 20 in the water, and so it's going to be really small, but once you get some of it in there and it establishes equilibrium, then whatever's remaining is going to keep going, so it's going to pump itself down into the aqueous layer. So this would be a universal extraction scheme. So if you've just got a, a, a mixture that, uh, that you want to separate, you've got all these different analytes in there, you can run it through this scheme and it's one, two, three, four, five different separations. So if we put, in, put it in the aqueous layer, a pH of two, and we pick chloroform, or sometimes they just use ethyl acetate as, a, as an organic layer. At pH 2, you're going to get all of those uh, acids and neutrals in the organic layer because the acids are protonated and they're neutral. And so they're going to go over to the organic layer, and then you're going to have an aqueous layer that has the bases, which are protonated, like the codeine, and you're going to have water solubles, like your metal cations. Okay? And anions. And so then that's the first extraction. You drain this into a beaker. So you have a beaker with your organic layer and a beaker with your aqueous layer. So now you've got two new mixtures and you put them into two separate separatory funnels. So let's work with the one on the left. We put that in a separatory funnel and now we add an aqueous layer, a brand new aqueous layer with a pH of 6. So we've moved the pH over some, and now we're going to partition things that have differences in the middle. And so weak acids would 
split apart and the neutrals would go into the organic layer and the strong acids and salicylic acid would end up in the aqueous layer. So now we've separated strong and weak acids and we've got two beakers now and the other beaker, so we've got three. Now we're going to take this one and put it into uh, the separatory funnel and we're going to dump that pH up to nine and extract. And this will change the weak and strong bases and flip them into the aqueous and organic layers. And then we come back over here, we take the organic beaker, put it in a set funnel with an aqueous layer of pH greater than 10, and we get the organic compounds that are just neutral, have never ionized at all, because they were always organic. They don't have an acid group, they don't have a base group. They just stay in the organic phase the whole time. And so we get those totally fat-soluble molecules that don't have any pH dependence at all. Notice they've been in the organic phase all the way down. And then those ones that are really, really weak acids and maybe some phenols and things, uh, they end up in the aqueous phase when you put them in such a strong basic environment and you deprotonate some of the alcohol groups. You can separate those into the aqueous phase. So we now have four beakers and then we're going to put this aqueous phase over here in contact with organic we're going to change that aqueous phase to pH 11, and we get the organic bases and the aqueous metals and water solubles. So metal cations never went into the organic phase. They stayed aqueous, 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 all the way down to the right. So this is a universal extraction scheme that would be suitable for separating all of these different things, strong acids, weak acids, total organics, and metal cations. And you may be after just this one, and you could stop here. You know, you could go to, to the left and then to the right, or the right and the left, and stop at those intermediate steps. But my question is, do you understand what's going on here? This chart's supposed to help with that. And we're just picking the different pHs and separating things based upon whether they're neutral or ionized. To do this, what do you think is the most important skill when you look at a molecule? So when you look at a molecule now, if I throw a drug up there, what are you going to look for immediately? It's acid or base. Yeah, and what would you see for acids? Go back to organic chemistry. Carboxylic acid, right? Um, OH groups are not acidic. You take really a strong, strong base, like phenol. We've got a phenol ring with an OH on it. It has a pH that you might be able to deprotonate it at pH 11, okay? So it does have a measurable pKa, but it's, it's not acidic. It's not an acidic proton. You'd have to really pull on that by putting it in a very strong base uh, before you could get that, but you could do that. That would be the one that you have to go all the way down here to get that really weak acid to, to go in the aqueous phase with a pH of 11. So you're looking for carboxylic acid. <coughs> What other kinds of things are you looking for? What indicates a base in these organic molecules? Yeah, any of the nitrogens. You have those lone pairs on the nitrogens, so any kind of amine. The primary, secondary, or tertiary, it doesn't matter. So we saw codeine, it had a, what, what is this in codeine? Here's the molecule down here. You know, that's a tertiary amine. It's, it's bonded to carbons, but it still has that lone pair of electrons and it can hydrogen bond to water. You put it in a, a, an, an acidic solution and it's gonna pull a proton off that water. And then that water is gonna go and react with some hydronium ion and go back to water. <clears throat> so you're looking for basic amines and carboxylic acids. And that's gonna be the basis for you uh, to separate these things. There's other kinds of uh, techniques that separate based upon polarity. So not just acid-base nature, but whether it has dipole moments and whether it has floppy electron clouds and so on. So these are all the different chromatography techniques. You've heard of most all of these. Liquid, li uh, liquid chromatography. The thing that I would like for you to, to reinforce, you probably learned this in the instrumental, but know the difference between normal phase and reverse phase. So normal phase and reverse phase deal with the stationary phase. And so normal phase, uh, liquid chromatography and also gas chromatography uh, has that polar stationary phase. 
It has aluminum oxide, most likely. And the same with thin layer chromatography. It's aluminum oxide on glass. And so that normal, that's a normal solid phase. It's a polar solid phase. So what that means is that polar molecules drag along that surface. They're polar, so they interact with the stationary phase and they come out last. If you have reverse phase, you have a non-polar stationary phase, something with a lot of phenyl groups on it. You get a polymer backbone, something like styrene. So you have CH2 groups along the way, and then you have uh, phenyl groups, or dimethylsiloxane. So like siloxane is the backbone, and it's got uh, di dimethyldiphenylsiloxane. So you've got the phenyl groups on there, and that will drag those nonpolar molecules along. And the polar ones aren't interested in the stationary phase, so the polar ones come out first in, in reverse phase chromatography. Then there's adsorption chromatography, where you just have a porous stationary phase. And things stick to it just because uh, of dispersion forces, so London dispersion forces. So the larger and floppier the electron cloud, things that have chlorine groups, things that have um, yeah, any of the halogens, with the exception of fluorine probably, things that have a lot of uh, fused ring structures, so again, extended electron clouds, those will adsorb and stick to the stationary phase. And the small molecules, the fully saturated hydrocarbons, they will fly right through because they really don't have anything to interact with the stationary phase. Uh, then you have ion exchange liquid chromatography, which just does exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's got a polymer backbone with acid groups or amine groups, and it can hold on to cations or anions. And so it's going to separate things based upon charge. Size exclusion liquid chromatography is, is also what it sounds like. So for polymers, you have a, a stationary phase with pores. And so the polymers get stuck in those pores. And so the ones that are small get stuck more frequently than the ones that are big. So you can send a polymer through this. And again, not a full-blown plastic, but, you know, things that are on the range of 200 to 500,000 uh, grams per mole, and it will spread that distribution out. And the, the smallest pieces will come out last. The big pieces go right through. Uh, and so you're excluding things on sides just by using the porous medium. Some call that gel permeation chromatography. So size exclusion and gel permeation are essentially the same technique. Then gas chromatography, I guess the, the most obvious thing in gas chromatography that would separate compounds is their boiling point because you're dealing with, with condensed versus vapor phase. And so if something has a higher boiling point, it's going to come out last. You typically ramp the temperature up. So the, the low boilers come out first, the high boilers come out last. Yes? Is it less than or equal to 150? That's, that's, um, that's just a nice rule of thumb. If you have something that boils above that, then it's getting close to the um, decomposition temperature of your stationary phase. So the stationary phase in gas chromatography, at least if it's like a normal or reverse phase filling, it's, it's a polymer. And so it will start to decompose at you know 280. Uh, so you want to stay pretty far away from that kind of temperature. Uh, and also your molecules, um, they need to come out in a reasonable amount of time. So if you have something that boils at 200, um, it's going to take a while for it to get through 30 meters of, of tubing. So. Supercritical fluid chromatography. Oh, so let's say if you had substances that had a really high boiling point, what do you do then? You put it in liquid chromatography. So instead of doing gas phase chromatography, you would just do liquid chromatography. Uh, and then this is coming down in price, the supercritical fluid chromatography. So that's using typically CO2. So it's, it's pressurized CO2 up to where it's a supercritical fluid. So it has the, the density of a liquid, but the properties of a gas. It, it can fill the whole container. It doesn't have a meniscus. So it's kind of a weird region between gas chromatography and liquid chromatography. So a lot of things are soluble in, in supercritical CO2 that are difficult to to be soluble in other substances. So it had, fills a niche. And because it fills a niche, 
and it's coming down in price, you're probably going to run across it more frequently. So it's expensive just because you have to have a lot of uh, equipment that goes, um, you know, pressure vessels, the stainless steel tubing, and so on, so that it can operate at those high pressures. You're talking. Uh, well, I can't. I can't remember off the top of my head how many atmospheres of pressure you're dealing with, but it's quite a lot. Yes. Why does liquid carbon dioxide the most expensive? Does it say the most expensive? They say that's coming down in price. Oh, supercritical fluid chromatography is coming down in price, and it's expensive because of all the stainless steel high pressure tubing that you need to use, and the pumps to pump CO2 up to that supercritical regime. So this torpedo in the past has been really expensive because uh, it wasn't mass produced. It was sort of a niche. But now, that, you know, as, as they say, well, this really does fill a need. So let's, uh, it, what makes it fill a need? Um, analyzes a wider range of molecules and does it very quickly. So faster analysis is saving money. Wider range is, is more versatility. So this versatility and fast analysis is a really good economic driver. And so they're saying, if we could clear our backlog of chemicals that we're analyzing um, by making this large capital investment, then it makes sense. And if it comes down in price, it's just going to be more adopted more. Then you're going to have standards written for it. And so it, it just snowballs into a mainstream technique. So that's, I, I predict that it's, it's moving more towards the mainstream from something that's done in like a few academic labs just for research sake, I think it's starting to get into the commercial production. How many people have done thin layer chromatography? Did y'all do that in organic? Anybody? Or do you do it? I know for some of the organic chemists, you do it for, for analyzing your products. Okay. And so it's a really easy technique. I don't know, have y'all had any nightmares with it? Has it been difficult for you or is it pretty easy? Yeah. Um, I did cotton chromatography and um, we completely missed one of the analytes yeah. putting it in. So it was supposed to be like a lovely color uh -huh. for a change and it was like, I I can't remember the colors exactly, but I'm going to go with the colors you had. It yeah. was yellow, nothing, phew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sometimes you can't see the compounds, they're not colored and you need to use a UV light or some other kind of thing or... Um, and so you will, you will look like nothing's happening, but you can shine certain kinds of wavelengths on there and see, okay, this molecule fluoresces. And so then you can see where that band is. This was one of the early experiments that I did in high school. Uh, my teacher, uh, Mrs. Blackman, she took a plant, you know, she had a plant in her room. She peeled a bunch of leaves off of her plant and ground them up in ethanol. And we did a com column cr uh, chromatography in class. It was so cool because the plant was naturally green leaves, but it had some red pigment in there. And we could see the green and red separate as it went down. And I just thought that was so cool. And so it was very visual because it was colored. But sometimes, again, these organic molecules are not colored, so you don't know what's happening until you shine a, a UV light on it or spray it with a developer solution. So you do the separation. Then let's talk about the thin layer chromatography. You may do a separation that's time-based, or if you just follow that solvent front, you see that it, it moves its way up. And so let's say you put your spot here. You put it in the eluent um, solution, and the solvent front moves up, and you can't see your molecule. And it, the solvent's just moving up the thin layer until it gets up here. And so then you pull it out of this elution chamber and quickly make a pencil mark. So you mark that solvent front with a pencil and the solvent evaporates and now your molecules have moved but you can't see them. You can spray them with a developer, something that reacts with that molecule makes a, a colored derivative. And then you can identify the spots. And a lot of the drug tests, like for um, the components in marijuana, you can do a thin layer chromatography, spray a developer on there and you'll see three different colors for the THC and CBD compounds and you see the different colors and you can confirm, okay, I've got all three spots. That's again, confirming that this is marijuana. Okay. Or if now, now maybe not marijuana where you could actually look at the leaves or the buds, but this is some waxy substance that someone was vaping and they were acting erratically. Is this vaping oil something that has THC or CBD in it? 
And so then you can do, again, thin air chromatography and do the developer and identify those compounds. <clears throat> Lastly, there's this interesting technique called enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. And so, and so this is getting into biochem, so I should probably let some of the biochemists give the talk, me being a p chemist. But you've got these little cartoons where you've got the enzyme, the drug, and the antibody. And there's because you have three different things, you can make this technique a number of different ways. You could have the you can have the enzyme on the plates or the antibody on the plates, the drugs, you have a substrate that causes a color change. So there's a lot going on with the ELISA tests. <clears throat> but this is one of the fastest growing techniques because you have companies producing these little micro titer plates that are already set up to do these analyses. You've got them for all kinds of substrates and drugs. Not just drugs, but also hormones. So you can, you can test these in automatic plate readers. And these are some of the, the plates that you have. You have 96 or 384 or 1,536 well plates. And you can do that many experiments at once. So I, I can't imagine doing this titration by hand. You know? yeah. And so these things are going to be done by machine. So you have machines that go in and fill those and wash them, and then put the analyte in, and put in the calibrations, and so on. How do you make sure they get them like sealed when you take it to another well? That's why these are done with by robot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, but if you think about you know a plate reader going in and giving you fifteen hundred and thirty six, you know readings, then that's that's pretty amazing. Talk about throughput. You know, we had a fellow come and talk to the forensics club years ago from the from the DEA. And we were asking, what's your day-to-day -day, you know, job like? And he said, well, let me tell you. He said, I'm kind of low on the totem pole. So I come in in the morning, and I have like 300 urine samples to prep. And I prep those, and I get them on the auto sampler do, to do an ELISA test. He said, I get all that on there, and the auto sampler will take those samples and put them into the plates and put in the calibration standards and everything like that, and it will do its thing. And it runs all through the midday. And he said... So from that point on, after about 10 o'clock, I'm done with the chemistry, and I'm writing reports from the previous day's analyses. So he puts in six hours of report writing, and then the results that he got that day go into the next day where he writes the reports and loads up. So it's just day-to-day, -day, loading the auto sampler and writing up yesterday's reports. So, I mean, that doesn't sound too glamorous. He is in a crime lab. He is at the bottom of the ladder. Uh, you know, he knows everything there is to know about that ELISA setup and doing your analysis. And so then he probably will move to something else. But, but these things are amazing. But that 1,536 well plate is going to have an enormous auto sampler where you're prepping the samples to be used on that robotic system. In order to um, sort of walk you through what's happening with the ELISA test, this is an ELISA test. You may recognize what that is. That is a pregnancy test. And so you can put the antibodies and the, and the, uh, the uh, enzymes and everything on that paper, and instead of sticking it on a, on a well plate that a machine reads, you can put it on you know, a white piece of paper and you can read it yourself with the color change. Okay. Now, you, these ELISA tests can be destroyed. You know, proteins denature if they get too hot. And so there always needs to be sort of a validation signature. So how are my proteins still good? And so you need to have a color change that happens just with the, the presence of all the, all the uh, um, presence of all of the things that are doing the test, but without the uh, drug, the thing that you're testing. So it's sort of a validation signature. You need a validation signature, and you need a signature that tells you if the thing you're testing for is there. So in this case, a hormone. What's nice is they put the validation signature as just a dash. And so that tells you the test is valid. But if it has the hormone there, they have a dash that goes 90 degrees to it. And that makes a plus. So if it's not there, you get a minus. And if it is there, you get a plus. The minus is the validation that says the proteins are intact, the substrate's there, all of the color change is ready to go but there's no hormone detected. 
But if you get the other, if you get the validation signature and the detection of the hormone, then you see a plus, and that's what, you know, the plus and minus. It's actually a chemical signature. The dash is the validation signature. The 90 degree thing that makes the plus is detecting the hormone that says you're pregnant. So let's watch uh, this video on the ELISA test. And it gives you one formulation of the various ELISA techniques.